Hi, everyone. So, um, oh, we've got a few. It's my great pleasure on behalf of the Physiological Society of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to present Professor Mary Lindsay, who's given the Physiological Society's Michael de Berg Daily Prize Lecture this year. So this is a biennial lecture that's given in the area of cardiac and vascular physiology in memory of Michael de Berg Daly, who's an eminent English physiologist who was very active in the society and studied a load of different topics in the area of respiratory and cardiac physiology, including the diving reflex in Alaskan seals. Um, Professor Lindsay has been awarded this prize lecture in recognition of her outstanding work on cardiac remodelling and the extracellular matrix, which we're going to hear about in a moment. Um, and so just to briefly introduce her, she's Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Research at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. She's had a career full of many, many publications, lots of grants, and has trained many scientists who have themselves gone on to be successful leaders. So we're really delighted to have her here to talk to us today about cardiac wound healing following myocardial infarction. So thank you, Professor Lindsay. Okay, it looks like I passed the first test. Good afternoon, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to FISSOC for asking me to come and tell you a little bit about our research. As a lot of you in the audience know, but maybe not everyone, a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, occurs when a coronary artery becomes occluded and generates uh, necrosis when it's of ischemia of a su sufficient duration to um, end up in tissue damage. In the US, about 1.5 million Americans have a first or second heart attack each year. And MI is an underlying etiology in about 80% of the cases of heart failure. Of those 1.5 million, about 75% get to the hospital, know they have an MI, get reperfused. There's about 25%, however, who do not undergo timely reperfusion for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that they don't know they're having a heart attack or they're misdiagnosed as having um, nausea or indigestion or something like that. And so for that 25%, they will not receive timely reperfusion. Also, um, those who know but don't get to the emergency department in time. I have a friend whose uncle had an MI. He woke up on a Friday morning with chest pain and he didn't want to ruin his weekend. So he waited until Monday to go to the doctor. He was not timely reperfused. Um, and so it happens. Um, also of those uh, 75% who are reperfused, about 25%, about a third of those will not have reflow. So even though they'll have the intervention performed, the artery won't actually restore blood flow. So that means that of, of the folks who have MI each year, somewhere around 50% are going to um, be at high risk for developing heart failure because they're not going to um, be reperfused or they're not going to have a reflow. And it's that group that we're interested in studying in my lab to better understand what happens after the MI that sets them up on the pathway to heart failure. And so over the last 25 years, we have done a lot of work mapping out the pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory to tissue repair pathway that occurs in the heart in the infarct zone after MI. And I just want to highlight um, Dr. Pendra Chalise. Um, he was a graduate student with me who defended in January of this year and is now doing a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Rebecca Gundry in Omaha. And he um, has spent the last four years um, working on um, many aspects of wound healing after MI. And he has a review article that is in press right now where um, he shows the diagram of the dif different cell types, the neutrophil, 
the monocyte macrophage, and the fibroblasts all undergo a continuum of changes through the first seven days of MI. At day one, they're pro-inflammatory cell types, contributing a lot of IL-1 beta in particular to the system. By day three, they're transitioning to anti-inflammation, where IL-10 becomes a player, as well as TGF beta. And then that is important for uh, deposition of the early scar. And then by day seven, all three cell types are going into a tissue repair phenotype where they are secreting a lot of extracellular matrix to help form that scar and mature the scar. And so our lab has spent my whole career looking at different components in the, these pathways. And so it occurred to us when we were mapping out the wound healing that occurs in the heart that there was a lot of similarities to what happens for skin wound healing. In skin, when it's wounded, there's an initial inflammatory phase followed by a proliferative phase followed by a remodeling phase. The major difference between skin and heart, of course, is that the cardiomyocyte does not regenerate to any significant level. And so while you'll get... Um, Reepithelialization in the skin after wound healing. And after MI, whatever cardiomyocyte loss occurs is going to be a permanent loss. And so, because there were similarities in the two processes, we asked the question and studied the hypothesis that wound healing efficiency after skin injury may predict cardiac wound healing efficiency after MI. And this is a study that Dr. Medea Basarovic Ajek um, took over um, when she was a postdoc fellow in my lab and completed and published earlier this year in AJP Heart and CERC. And um, Medea um, was the one who was instrumental in um, putting together all of this data and having a story that made sense. And so I'm happy today to be presenting um, her work. She returned to Sweden in the beginning of July and is setting up her own lab at the University of Uppsala. And so you'll be hearing more about her in the years to come, I'm sure. So this is the experimental design. We had two injury models. The first was a skin wounding where we performed, used a three millimeter skin wound um, biopsy punch to wound at the back of the neck between the scapula of a mouse. And then the second injury was myocardial infarction. And so the skin wounding occurred one month before MI. In the, in the same mice, we did skin wounding and measured over three days closure rates of the skin wound and took plasma at day minus 25, which is day three after the wounding. And then a month later, we did give MI surgery to induce MI, and at days three and at day seven, we took echo uh, cardiograms and plasma collection, and then we sacrificed the mice. So 69% of the mice survived to day seven, 32% um, did not survive between days three and seven. And so that just shows out here that the survival, 68% um, made it to day seven and were sacrificed, and 32% um, died between days three and seven. For the permanent occlusion model in mice, unless there's a technical issue, the mice are gonna survive to day three, and um, survival is close to 100%. Uh, and most of the post-MI deaths <clears throat> occur between days three and seven due to either rupture or uh, acute congestive heart failure or arrhythmia. And so um, comparing survivors and non-survivors, when we looked at the day three echo, because everyone had day three echo, um, infarct size did not explain the survival rate. Um, heart rate is just shown here to show that they had comparable heart rates. Infarct wall thickness, ejection fraction, fractional shortening, uh, diastolic volume, diastolic dimension, none of those track between survivors and non-survivors. Systolic dimension, how much dilation was occurred by day three after MI, was the only predictor of who was going to then go on to uh, not survive. Interestingly, when we looked at the skin wound, healing efficiency, and so we basically took pictures of the skin wound over the three-day period and then measured rate of closure. 
Those who went on to survive after MI had a faster closure rate than the mice who had the slower uh, rate um, and didn't survive after MI. And so this just shows in a different um, a correlation matrix, a different visualization, the same thing, that wound closure at day three was a positive predictor of who was gonna go on to survive the MI um, a month later. And at day three after the MI, the extent of dilation measured by systolic um, dimension was a, a predictor of who was gonna survive. And so we also performed glycoproteomic analysis on the um, plasma samples from the day minus 25, which is day three after skin wounding, and day three after MI. And we performed um, glycoproteomic analysis because if you know anything about plasma and mass spectrometry, you'll know that albumin and about nine other proteins contribute like 95% of the total protein concentration in the plasma. And so um, techniques that eliminate albumin from the equation are ways to enrich for other components that may be of interest. And so we basically use lectin to pull out um, proteins that are glycosylated, and then we um, use PGNS, P and GASF to um, take off the glycans and use mass spectrometry to identify those proteins. And so this was a nice way to deplete albumin without having to actually do anything to the sample. And so when we looked at, we're gonna look at the day three after MI first. In this cohort, we had um, just under 1,300 proteins, glycoproteins that were identified by mass spectrometry. Of those, there was 278 that differentiated between survivors and non-survivors. That's a lot of protein. Um, and if you're a postdoc or a grad student, you're, you, know, you don't necessarily wanna be looking through that whole list. You, know, you wanna get something quicker, sooner than later um, to get to publication, right? And so what we did was <clears throat> Medea looked at just by p-value and ranked the top 10 here. And we saw that collagen three came up as the most different by p-value. Um, but then there was a bunch of other proteins um, that didn't necessarily um, ring our bell for you know, something that we would be knowing about in terms of like extracellular matrix. And so I think it's um, apropos at this conference to talk about following the physiology. Anytime you have a lot of changes, go back to the physiology. And so what Medea did is she did a combination of forward and backward selection and looked at all of those variables that were different and compared them to which ones predicted survival the best. And what she came up with is these two factors, alpha-2 macroglobulin and ELL-associated factor one. These two um, explain 66% of the um, survival difference. And so EAF1 is increased in those who didn't survive. What do we know about EAF1? It stimulates RNA polymerase two transcription rate, and that's about all we know. Um, and so then Medea also correlated it with cardiac physiology variables. And none of the uh, cardiac physiology variables by ECHO uh, correlated with the individual values of EAF1 for the individual mice. And so we think this means that EAF1 is a marker of generic poor wound healing and not necessarily specific to cardiac wound healing. Alpha-2 macroglobulin was also increased in those who did not survive. And it is an acute phase protein released in plasma 24 to 48 hours after tissue injury. It's a broad spectrum protease inhibitor. It binds and regulates cytokines, including TNA, TNF alpha, IL-6, and IL-1 beta. And importantly, it correlated very well with markers of LV dilation. As shown here, the day three diastolic volume is plotted on the y-axis and the plasma concentration of alpha-2 macroglobulin is plotted on the x-axis and there is a strong linear correlation, um, highly significant, 
between the extent of dilation and how much alpha-2 macroglobulin was concomitantly in the plasma at that same time. Likewise, and similar to diastolic, systolic volume showed the same thing, higher systolic volume, higher alpha-2 macroglobulin levels. And so our lab spends a lot of time thinking about Reviewer 2. And if you're on Twitter, you all know Reviewer 2. Uh, and so we try, we think that the best defense is a good offense, and we try to predict what Reviewer 2 is going to say, and then we try to preempt and, and put that in the paper before we submit it. And so Medea um, said we're going to need to show that alpha-2 macroglobulin is in the infarct because we've just measured it in the plasma. We don't know the tissue source. And so she did multi-analyte immunofluorescence looking at alpha-2 macroglobulin, and it's an orange color. At day zero, no MI um, controls. There was um, no alpha-2 macroglobulin seen in the tissue. By day one, there was robust increase, and this is just blow up down here. Um, day one, and then it increases at day three and increases further at day seven, showing strong um, staining in the infarct region after MI. <clears throat> and so then we took a second cohort of mice um, because the question could be, well, what are the chances of you being able to reproduce that even within your own lab? And so the second cohort of mice, uh, at day three, we took plasma, and at day seven, um, plasma and echo, and then sacrifice at day seven. We had 21 mice in this cohort, and a little bit unusual, we had one mouse that died before day seven. Um, other, all 20 of the other mice lived um, for that time point. And I should back up and say that for both this study and the previous cohort, we had about equal numbers of male and female mice included um, in, that, in that evaluation. And so when you look at this validation cohort, infarct size was about 51%. Um, Heart rates were similar between groups. Diastolic volumes increased over time, as did systolic volumes, and ejection fraction um, went down immediately, which is what you would expect when cardiomyocyte loss occurs within um, beginning at 60 minutes after MI. And so that just basically tells you that we gave MI in those mice. And so when we looked at the plasma at day seven by ELISA, and we compared the day seven diastolic volume to the day seven alpha-2 macroglobulin levels in the plasma, again, there was a very nice um, linear regression showing that the higher alpha-2 macroglobulin, the more dilation was occurring. And we used ELISA um, because before we had used mass spec, and so we wanted a second technique to you know, um, further validate the reproducibility of this. And then, of course, what's reviewer two going to say? Well, what about in the infarct, right? And so we took infarct tissue um, from the day seven um, time point and did immunoblotting, and day seven diastolic volume compared with the tissue alpha-2 macroglobulin levels also showed a linear regression. Not quite as nice as the plasma, um, but still significant. And so the higher the alpha-2 macroglobulin, the more dilation um, is occurring. And so then what about humans? Does it happen in humans? So we had plasma from patients with MI, and um, compared to healthy controls, uh, at 48 hours after MI, there's a signif significant increase in alpha-2 macroglobulin in this cohort. And so alpha-2 macroglobulin strongly and positively correlated with the current cardiac uh, wound healing status. And so it's a good marker of what's going on right now. And so going back to that day minus 25 plasma, plasma this is three days after skin wounding, because we really wanted to know what predicts. You know, you don't want to know what's happening right now as much as you want to know what's going to happen, you know, tomorrow or next week or next month. And so in the um, day three after skin wounding in this plasma, we had 184 detected glycoproteins. Of those, um, there was only one that predicted future survival, and that was apolipoprotein D. We also looked at what was concomitant um, reflection of the skin wound healing, 
and it was also apolipoprotein D. And so I like that it both came out as being um, both concomitant but also future uh, indicators of wound healing status. And then also vitamin D binding protein also showed, uh, showed uh, correlation with current uh, skin wound healing status. And then for the proteins at um, the day minus 25 plasma that predicted future LV dilation, uh, galactin-3 binding protein and the CPG, corticosteroid binding globulin, both of those um, predicted 44% of the LV dilation after MI. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about these guys. So galactin-3 binding protein, galactin-3's had a strong history of having association with heart failure, and for over 20 years, there's been a number of studies done looking at galactin-3 and, and what its role is in um, cardiac remodeling. This is the binding protein of galactin-3. And in the day um, minus 25 plasma, it predicted future dilation. So plotted on the y-axis is the day three after MI diastolic volume compared with the skin wound um, day three um, plasma levels of galactin-3 binding protein. And there was a negative correlation so that galactin-3 binding protein was higher in those that had less dilation, indicating that there may be a protective effect of this binding protein. Um, CBG showed this, a similar correlation, but in the opposite direction. CBG was higher with um, more dilation. And so vitamin, uh, vitamin D binding protein correlated with current skin wound healing and predicted future MI dilation. Shown in the first graph is the percent of wounds closure that occurred by day three. And in the x-axis is the day minus 25 vitamin D binding protein in the plasma. And it showed a negative uh, correlation indicating that the higher the vitamin D binding protein, the less wound was closure was closed, and so slower wound closure with more vitamin D binding protein. In the um, day three infarct wall thickness, shown here on the y-axis uh, um, against the day three um, vitamin D binding protein, so this is both day three MI, there was also a negative correlation indicating that the more vitamin D binding protein is seen at day three MI, the more infarct wall thinning that's occurring. And then finally, the diastolic volume at day three of MI compared with the um, skin wound uh, day minus 25 vitamin D binding protein in the plasma had a positive correlation showing that there's more vitamin D binding protein with more dilation. And so moving to apolipoprotein D, it negatively correlated with skin wound healing and later in my survival. Shown on the left is the percent of the skin wound that was closed by day three plotted against apolipoprotein D. And this shows a negative correlation showing that apolipoprotein D is higher the slower the wound is closing. And then after MI, um, the apolipoprotein D that was seen at day minus 25 predicts future um, survival in, um, in the same cohort of mice. And so it was interesting when Medea did the Western for apolipoprotein D, uh, D, what she saw was that there was not a difference in apolipoprotein D. If you look here, um, it shows the arbitrary units. And um, this was um, indicated that it was actually the glycosylation of apolipoprotein D that was different between these groups rather than the total amount of apolipoprotein D. And so that highlights that you really need to look at the um, type of the protein and if it's glycosylated or phosphorylated, et cetera, to know that it's signaling. And so what was interesting is when she looked at the males versus the females, what she saw was in the male mice, there was an increase in apolipoprotein D in the mice that did not survive. 
In the females, there is no difference. And I'll point out that there is only two female mice that did not survive, and so we couldn't do statistics. But this, um, this um, y-axis, if you look at the scale of this one compared to here, there's more apolipoprotein D in the females at all times um, at both in the both survivor and non-survivor group than there is in the male mice. And so for, for we don't know yet why, but apolipo D is very, um, is very strong um, affecting against in the male mice um, more so than the female mice. And so looking at male mice, uh, Medea took peritoneal macrophages, stimulated them directly with apolipoprotein D, and then did QRT-PCR for a number of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. The um, ones shown here, CCL3, CCL5, IL-1-beta, IL-12A, those are all the pro-inflammatory uh, genes that were elevated with direct apolipoprotein D stimulation of the macrophage. IL-6 and TNF-alpha were also measured and were not different. Of the anti-inflammatory genes, only IL-10 was elevated with apolipoprotein D um, stimulation. And its level of um, stimulation is much lower than these other um, pro-inflammatory. And so arginase-1, MRC-1, TGF-beta-1, YM-1, none of those were different between groups. And so this tells us that the predominant action of apolipoprotein D on the macrophage is to stimulate a pro-inflammatory cytokine profile. And so that also goes back to the best biomarkers have a physiological role. They're just not bystanders. And so we also looked at fibroblasts. Apolipoprotein D did not affect cardiac or skin fibroblast proliferation or migration. Um, the first graph is showing proliferation, and apolipoprotein D did not change proliferation rates in the cardiac fibroblast. Um, the cardiac fibroblast migration also was not changed with apolipoprotein D stimulation, nor were the skin fibroblasts. Um, migration change. And so this indicates that um, the predominant effect of apolipoprotein D is on the macrophage rather than on the fibroblast. And so in conclusion, I've shown you that faster skin wound healing predicts MI survival, that alpha-2 macroglobulin strongly correlates with current cardiac wound healing, that galactin-3 binding protein predicts future MI dilation, at vitamin D binding protein negatively correlates with skin and cardiac wound healing, and that apolipoprotein D negatively correlates with skin and cardiac wound healing by promoting pro-inflammation in macrophages, I should have added, in male mice. And then finally, the overall conclusion is that skin wound healing is a mirror to cardiac wound healing. And so I just want to give a plug for AJP Heart. Um, if you have any uh, research related with cardiovascular complications of COVID, exercise, physical activity, or psychomere, cytoskeleton, and mechanobiology research, we have new calls for papers that just opened up. And in the next month, we're going to have a call on uh, car cardiac fibroblasts and then one on aging in November. And so um, consider AJP Hart for your submissions. And with that, I will uh, stop and thank you and take questions. George Calarigas, University of Iceland. Mary, great to see you here. Great talk, thank you. Maybe I can help start a little bit the discussion. So um, I was very happy to see your male and female data. Mm. That's a great job done. Uh, going back to the correlations for the alpha-2 microbrubulin, the galactin-3 binding protein, you mentioned it yourself that the correlations, they were a little bit lower. And uh, although the data were a little bit too fast for me, mm. but I think that there was a better correlation for the females could this be the case, that maybe if you did a sex-stratified analysis, you would find a better correlation there? I, you know, I, 
I know Medea went back and looked at everything male versus female, and that um, apolipoprotein D was the only thing that came out with st a statistical significance um, between male and female. But I don't know if we went back and redid the regressions by sex. So that would be something for us to revisit. Yeah. Then can I have another question? So for the apolipoprotein D data, uh, you showed that the protein levels, they were higher in the females than in the males. However, the pro-inflammatory profile was strongly expressed in the males. Right. Any ideas about that? Well, you know, so I have, I have a previous postdoc who is now um, faculty at Medical University of South Carolina, Christine Dion, De, De Leon Pinnell, um, who, by the way, just today found out she's being promoted to associate professor. But anyway, she did a nice study looking at male and female differences after MI, and she found that at day one, the new, that there are, um, let me see if I get this right, there are fewer neutrophils in the females, but that they were more efficient in breaking down the necrotic tissue. And so there was differences in the neutrophil profiles and their inflammatory status. And she mapped out, you know, which cytokines were, um, you know, responsible for that. But there's definitely differences between male and females in inflammation. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Cordovit from Lübeck. Um, I was wondering your prediction with the wound healing um, with respect to survival. And you mentioned that the mice die from ventricle rupture in part or mm. from arrhythmia. So my question is how many of those mice die actually from ventricle rupture and can that be compared to uh, accident such occasions also in humans? Yeah. So. Um, Nick Frangiogiannis had a very nice study published maybe two or three years ago now where he actually did a very careful dissection and histopathological examination of rupture in mice uh, with permanent occlusion. And his numbers, it was somewhere between a third to a half of the mice who die from permanent occlusion die from rupture. And our lab sees similar values, and I know others have reported similar. So, you know, somewhere between a third to a half of those mice are gonna die of rupture. And then what was, did you have a second part? Yeah, yeah, if, um, how is it in humans? In humans, yeah, and so, you know, for the humans who don't get reperfused, it's, it's not that different. Um, but because reperfusion, uh, you know, occurs with so many, um, reperfusion does change the kinetics for rupture. And so the, there is a little bit of human-mouse difference, not so much in terms of their physiology, but in terms of the treatments that are given to them. Thank you. Mm. David Eisner, Manchester. You've used natural variations to correlate the concentrations of various factors with survival. I wonder whether you've also thought about actually changing the concentrations of those things to look for mechanisms and see if it, it yeah. does affect survival. Yeah, so that's uh, one thing Medea's already submitted a grant to do that for her next project. Daniela Eckley from Zurich. Um, you showed this negative correlation with the vitamin D binding protein. Do you have any more mechanistic? background to that? Has it anything to do with the vitamin D status, calcitriol, calcitriol? Yeah, that's a great question because you know like in the 90s there was so much work done with vitamin D as a, a potential treatment for cardiovascular disease, for heart failure, etc. And none of those clinical trials really showed any efficacy. Um, and so our data is on the vitamin D binding protein. And so I saw a poster this afternoon that was talking about in skeletal muscle, vitamin D binding protein having effects that weren't just binding vitamin D. Imagine that, your protein's named for something it doesn't really do. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's a whole area of investigation. We, uh, we just published this a few months ago. Um, and so vitamin D binding protein, apolipoprotein D, uh, galactin-3 binding protein, all of those are on our radars for you know, more mechanistic studies to see if, they can, if we can uh, um, link in uh, causation with that biomarker um, evaluation.
works. Does this work? Um, I had a question. <laughs> um, what does the fact you've done the um, skin wound before the um, MI, mm. does that have an impact on anything that happens later? I, you sound like reviewer too uh, for when we really <laughs> did submit the paper. Because they, they really thought, you know, because, yeah, anyway. Um, I don't think, because you, you know, you would think that there would be potential for like cardio protection, and you know, there's a lot of um, studies being done that if you have slight ischemia stress, then it makes it better after you know a bigger ischemia stress. Um, so uh, you know, none of our survival rates, none of our dilation, none of our remodeling indices that we looked at were were different in the cohort of mice that we gave the wounding to and then 30 days later gave the MI to compared with the 2,000 other mice that we've given MIs to over the 20 years. Um, so I, you know, that gets asked and, and of course you can't ever, you can't ever say for sure. Um, you know, the one, the one thing that was interesting is when we did the validation cohort and we had like 95, 97% survival, if anything, it showed that the wounding might have been bad later on. But, but again, that doesn't stand up with our you know, historical data. So I don't think that the skin wounding itself did anything to plus or, or negative to the, the MI response. And I think intrinsically that would kind of make sense, you know, in humans, I mean, we get cut all the time, right? And so it doesn't necessarily change how we, I, I think, and yeah, I have another thought. Um, it, I didn't point out too, um, too much, but in the glycoproteomic analysis, if you'll remember, like after MI, the MI plasma had like 1,300 proteins. It had tons of proteins in that plasma. The um, skin wounding was like 184, or something like that. So the, wo the skin wounding is very mild compared to that MI stimulus. So I think that's, I think there's a, a logarithmic difference in the wounding that was occurring in the two models. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't see any other questions, so I think it's time to actually present the prize. So it's my greatest, I often silently present the prize, my greatest pleasure. Thank you. And, and that's it. I think. And that's it. We're, we're done. It's time for the reception. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just a welcome reception. So um, have a nice evening.